All right. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be, for the month of November, in the book of Ruth. Um, Ruth chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to actually begin in the last verse of Judges, Judges 21, verses 25. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. And then Ruth 1, I'm going to read the chapter. It says, During the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. A man left Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died, and she was left with her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah, the other was named Ruth. And after they lived in Moab about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two children and without her husband. She and her daughter-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab because she had heard in Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people's needs by providing them food. She left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughter-in-laws, and traveled along the road leading back to the land of Judah. Naomi said to them, Each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you rest in the house of a new husband. She kissed them, and they wept loudly. They said to her, We insist on returning with you to your people. But Naomi replied, Return home, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Am I able to have more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. Go on, for I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought that there was still hope for me to have a husband tonight and to bear sons, would you be willing to wait for them to grow up? Would you restrain yourself from remarrying? No, my daughters, my life is too much bitter for you to share because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Again, they wept loudly, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you and me. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped talking to her. The two of them traveled until they came to Bethlehem. And when they entered Bethlehem, the whole town was excited about their arrival, and the local woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, she answered, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has opposed me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi came back from the territory of Moab with her daughter-in-law Ruth, the Moabitess, and they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So I want to begin a couple weeks series on the book of Ruth just simply because there's some stuff in here I think just so applicable for us in the season that we're living in, in the times that we're living in. Especially, I forgot to say this, but the last couple weeks I want to say thank you to Sa and Marcus for speaking um, and ministering from the Word as well. Grateful for you guys this morning. But if you've ever read the book of Judges that's right before Ruth, it's a pretty depressing book. It's a book that has this constant theme or cycle. It begins with the people forgetting God and all that he's done for them. They forget his faithfulness. They forget the miracles that he's done. They forget all the goodness that God has shown to them. And then because of their forgetfulness, God sends an enemy or another nation to bring judgment on the people. And after a while, after suffering, the people cry out to God in for, for deliverance, and God will eventually raise up a deliverer or a judge that's used to deliver the people. The people repent. They worship God for a season, and all of a sudden, this cycle repeats itself again. They forget God. 
God sends judgment. Um, they cry out to God. God sends a deliverer, and they worship God for a season, and it's repeated over and over. And it's, when you read it, you almost get frustrated. You're like, why can't you just get it? Why can't you see that it, when you follow God, things go well? When you don't follow God, disaster strikes. And you get to the last verse of Judges, and the author basically says the reason why this is happening. He says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And then we get to Ruth, the story of this wonderful young lady by the name of Ruth. Judges is all about this big national view. And now we're zooming down. And Ruth gives us this intimate insight into the life of one family in that same period. Terrible dark days characterized by rebellion, disobedience, days characterized by God's hope for Israel, seemingly unfulfilled. It seems that the hopes of Israel are dashed. It seems that without a king who would point them to God, they're in trouble, and we can be left wondering if there are any faithful people left and if God's plans will ever be fulfilled. We can almost cry out and say, God, what are you going to do about this? And when we open up the book of Ruth, it's almost like reading, meanwhile, in another city in another country in Moab, while the national crisis is happening back at home, a personal tragedy is unfolding in the life of this one family through which God is raising up a very unlikely, through a very unlikely family, not, who, not only the great king David, but ultimately the king of kings. The king who judges says is so desperately needed will not come through powerful judges or deliverers, but through a pair of widows, one of them a foreigner, who both put their trust in Jesus. And while the end of Judges bemoans the absence of a king, the meaning of the name of the first person that's mentioned in Ruth, Elimelech, means my God is my king. The king who we really, really need. The opening verses signal that this is a time of hope. And yet it's also plain that this is a time of tragedy. And before long, hope turns to tragedy, not only as the father has died, but the sons have died. And despite the apparent chaos at a national scale, and despite the apparent chaos at a personal scale, God is working out his purposes for the world through this family. You know, in Ruth, there are no miracles. In Ruth, there are no dreams. In Ruth, there are no supernatural visions. In Ruth, there are no supernatural strength or special signs. In Ruth, it seems like God is absent. But simply what we discover is God is at work through the everyday, the mundane events of some people who choose to follow Jesus when everything around them seems like God is absent. You know, nowadays there's this real pressure for us to project to the world that our lives are all smiley, happy, shiny. Sometimes we look at other people's lives, or at least look at their lives through the lens of Facebook or Instagram, and we feel like, man, I wish I was living their life. I wish I was enjoying all that they had. I wish I could do some of the things that they were doing. We feel like they've got their act all together, and somehow our lives are miserable. And we look at everyone's life, and we're like, man, everything is going well for them, but not for me. I wish things were a little different. I wish things were better. And when things don't go according to our plan, we often left wondering, what is God doing? Where is God in this moment? Why is God seem silent? Whether that be jobs or illnesses or relationships or the loss of loved ones, our lives can be full of unexpected and very painful turn of events. And this friends, can cause us to question if God really is in control and even if his purposes really are good. As we look at Ruth, we can be encouraged that not only is God working out his purposes, but that he is at work behind the scenes, even through the pain, 
and is calling us to be faithful in the midst of it. As we look at this very first chapter, amidst vulnerability, amidst bitterness, amidst people facing crossroads in life, we're encouraged to remember the Lord, trust in God's goodness, and commit to him. Three things I want you to see. Number one, remember the Lord. In the face of vulnerability, Naomi remembers the Lord. Look at verse 3. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies. She's left with her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah. The other one was named Ruth. They lived in Moab for 10 years, and then the sons die. Naomi is left without her two children, without her husband. It's difficult to overestimate how vulnerable these women would have been. Naomi, who presumes that it's entirely unlikely that she will ever remarry, let alone have children, is not only living in a foreign land, not only has lost her husband, but now has lost her sons. In an ancient world, being a widow would make you incredibly vulnerable. Widows were not only regularly taken advantage of or ignored, but they were economically and socially marginalized because the structure of society was deeply embedded around the notion of family. That's why Jewish law would prescribe that whoever was the nearest relative of the husband who had died would take care of the widow. But there were no options for Naomi. And if the girls wanted to wait, Naomi points out, it might never happen. Look at verse 12. Return home, my daughters. Go on, I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me to have a husband, would you be willing to wait for them to grow up? Would you restrain yourself from marrying? In Naomi's eyes, she's saying, the girls, follow me. It's basically you're saying that you're going to live single for the rest of your life without ever having an opportunity to have a family. And yet, despite being completely aware of her situation, Naomi does something remarkable, something almost absent in the book of Judges. In that moment, she remembers the Lord. She was vulnerable, and she chooses to remember the Lord, verse 6, she and her daughter-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab because she heard in Moab that the Lord paid attention to her people's needs by providing them food. You know, instead of her predicament driving her away from God, she uses her predicament to push in to God. Oftentimes in our lives, I don't know about you, in my life, when things don't go the way that I want it to go, I pull away. And when things are going well, I'm like, oh, look, God is blessing me. God is providing for me. Oftentimes when we face challenging times in our lives amidst pain or anger or confusion, whatever we're feeling, we're faced with the option of either turning away from God or pressing into God. And Naomi, in the midst of incredible pain, in the midst of incredible hardship, in the midst of incredible difficulty, chooses to say, you know what, I'm going back to God. I'm going back to where God is. I'm going to press in to God. In fact, the impression is not simply that she's pressing in, but she's turning back. In the, the first chapter, there were almost 12 times we hear this idea of turning back. There's this, of course, the geographical idea of turning back to the place from where they came, but there's this also this spiritual idea, this repentance, this idea of turning back to Jesus. See, despite there being a famine, Moab was really a strange choice for them to go to. The Moabites were enemies. They often encountered Israel with times of war and oftentimes destroyed Israel. The Moabites had been banned from worshiping in the temple because they had not let the Israelites pass through the land when they, the time of the Exodus. The Moabites had most recently seriously oppressed the people of Israel, and it's believed that their worship of a particular God even included human sacrifice. The Moabites sought to control nature through fertility rights while the Israelites were taught to trust in God for everything. They were fundamentally different people with a rocky past, a shaky future, a different God, and yet that is a land to which they fled to escape death when in reality in that land all they faced and experienced was death. And yet now as Naomi turns back, we see a glimpse of her faith as she bids farewell to Ruth and Orpah. She says, Listen, go back to your parents' home. May God show kindness on you as you have shown to me. May God grant each of you rest in the house of a new husband. This is not 
just Naomi hearing that the grass is greener on the other side. But this is her remembering and turning back to God who provides good, who shows kindness, who gives rest. When she says, may God show you kindness, she's saying, may you receive the unmerited grace and goodness of God. I just said this earlier, but one of the things that stood out to me so much during our trip in South Africa was the faithfulness of God's people in the midst of incredible hardships and difficulties. The first day of the conference was pastors just sharing in an open space, in a vulnerable space, how they're struggling, their hardships, their difficulties, their pain, things that they normally probably can't talk about in front of their own people, right? And there's a space that was created for them. And guys, the pastors were real. We were talking, listening to pastors saying they want to quit. They're talking to, listening to pastors saying that it's lonely, it's hard, it's difficult. Pastors who were scared out of their mind about what their future hold. Pastors whose kids are rebelling and yet they're trying to lead people to Jesus. Pastors who have no idea where food is coming, going to come from because the economy has collapsed and there's no money for them. I sat there thinking that in the, I'm in the midst of some incredibly faithful people in the midst of some incredibly challenging circumstances. They could have chosen to say, God, I chose to follow you, and you allow all this bad stuff to happen to me. Forget you. They say, you know what, God? I've chosen to follow you. Regardless of what happens, I'm going to keep pressing in to you. I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep pushing into you. Whether my family turns out okay, whether food is provided for me, whether everything turns out well at church, whether I stay in ministry or not, I'm going to keep pressing in to you. Friends, oftentimes in life, we have that choice. We have that decision we have to make. And when things get hard, do you push away from God and blame God? Or do you push into God and say, you know what, God, I know you've been faithful back then. I know you've been good back then. I don't know why I'm going through this stuff right now, but I'm going to choose to say, God, if you've been faithful back then, I know you'll be faithful today and you'll be faithful tomorrow. Do you choose to say, God, If things don't go the way that I expect, I choose to trust you because I know my life is in the palm of your hands. Do you choose to say, God, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know that you're the one who knows my future. Do you choose to press into God in those moments? Or do you choose to pull away from God in those moments? See, it's so easy for us to think that because we have come to Jesus, that because we're following Jesus, everything should go the way that we expect it. I'm reminded my plans are not your plans. And oftentimes we say that, oh, it's because God has something better for me. But no, sometimes God wants you to go through some hardships and difficulties because God is doing something in you that's more important than you being happy or satisfied. Listen, God has you. In those moments when life is difficult, you choose to say, I'm going to push into God. I'm going to remember God. I don't know where you are this morning, and I have no idea what you're facing, but in the midst of that, are you going to be someone who pushes into Jesus? Are you going to be someone who pushes away from Jesus? Are you someone that expects God to just simply make your life good and great because you're following him and then get frustrated when things don't go your way? Are you going to be someone that says, God, when I gave my life to you, I gave it all to you. Well, whatever happens, I choose to pursue you. The first thing we need to see is in the face of vulnerability, we need to remember God. Number two, we need to trust in God's goodness. We need to trust in God's goodness. Despite bitterness, Naomi trusts in the goodness of God. As the various elements of this tragic predicament is revealed in quick succession, We're meant to be left with this impression of disaster upon disaster upon disaster. Naomi leaves Bethlehem with a husband and two sons, and she returns a widow with two widowed daughter-in-laws. And as she comes to grip with the reality of her circumstances, she copes not by denial or blissful ignorance or sugarcoating reality. She acknowledges the reality of her bitterness. Verse 13, she says, My daughters, my life is too much bitter for you to share with me because the Lord's hand has turned against me. 
And when she arrives back at home, and if the people wonder if this is really her, she's so aware of how dire her situation is, she makes a heartful play on her name. She says, don't call me Naomi because that means sweet, but call me Mara, which means bitter. And she says, why do you call me Naomi? Because the Lord has opposed me. The Almighty has afflicted me. That word Almighty there? is the word Shaddai. It's a title that carries the connotation that the Lord is the Lord who fulfills his promises. And it's especially used in the Old Testament regarding the promises that God made through the descendants of Abraham. And so when Naomi cries out here, this is not simply her railing against God, but a trusting cry amidst pain. She's saying, you can see the bitterness I've experienced, the famine, the, bur- the debts, the burials, the questionings, the partings, the apparent hopelessness, but I know the God of Shaddai. I know the God who made promises to my forefathers, and I can leave the explanation and even the responsibility to him because I can trust him. Naomi is doing something quite extraordinary here. And even though she doesn't see a way out of this, even though she can't necessarily see the good in this, she has the humility to leave it all in the hands of God. Not because her faith is strong, but because the God that she serves has a track record that he is good. That's what seems to be evident here. And it will be evident in Naomi's life. If there's something that you feel heartbroken or bitter about in your life, please don't just park it to the side and let it drive a wedge between you and God. No, take it to him, express it to him, recall his goodness, trust in his promises. When things are going well, we rarely demand God to explain what's happening, what God's called us to do based on the history of his character. But when things are going hard, based on the history of his character, our call is to trust him, even when we don't know what's going on around us. Naomi demonstrates what it looks like to keep going with God, to recall his goodness, even when we can't grasp it, yet willing to leave such questions in the confidence of God's purposes. Number three, you commit to the Lord as God. Ruth here is faced with a crossroad. She chooses not only to follow Naomi, but she commits to make Naomi's Lord her Lord. Verse 16, don't plead with me to abandon you or return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Listen, this is not just a mere sentimentality or a nice statement that she's making here. Ruth is here at a crossroad. She can go back to her people where there's security, there's safety, there's food, there's shelter. Or she can go with Naomi where there's almost no security, there's danger, there's, there's insecurities, there's all sorts of stuff that could happen, but God is with her. And she emphatically chooses Naomi and her God. This is a conversion experience for Ruth. Naomi, I don't want my gods anymore. I want your gods. I want your God. I would rather sooner abandon my security and my safety and my comfort than walk away from you and the God that you serve. When Ruth says the Lord, she's actually taking the covenant name of God, Yahweh, upon her lips. You need to take that in for a moment. This is a spectacular moment in the life of Ruth. Naomi has been completely open about her bitterness. She's been completely open that God's hand has been against her. She's been completely open about her uncertainty. She's been completely open about the, her future and what that, what that entails. There's no voice from heaven. There's no burning bush. There's no angelic vision. There's no supernatural sign. But something about Naomi's witness and her love for God in the midst of tragedy and ordinariness of life, even in the midst of some hard circumstances, is speaking to Ruth. And Ruth says, I want the God that you're serving. Listen, how you live your life in the midst of hardships, people see that. People see that. 
how you live your life and trust God when things are going not the way that you expected. People see that Ruth saw Naomi's trust in God in the midst of incredible trying seasons and said, you know what, I don't know what the future holds, but I know that your God is faithful. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. It's a Ruth is saying, listen, you've showed me so much love, and if you still trust your God now in the midst of all the stuff you're going through, even when your world is falling apart, listen, I'm willing to follow you as well. Verse 22, Naomi comes back from the territory of Moab with her daughter-in-law, Ruth the Moabitess. They arrive in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Friends, I don't know the circumstances of your life, but I do know this, that just as God was working out his purposes through Naomi and Ruth, He's also working out his purposes in your life, even though you don't see it now. Even when it seems mundane, even when it's hard. In his book, River Out of Eden, Richard Dawkins, who professes to be an atheist, makes the following statement. He says, In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect, if there is. At bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing, nothing but pitiful indifference. Dawkins will tell you that there's no point to the things that you experience in life, the struggles, the pains, the hurts, the wounds, there's no point to it. But this word says different. It's not just luck. It's not just blind optimism. Because, friends, we know how the story ends. God is working out his purposes, and he will bring them to completion. How can we be so sure? Because out of the tragic circumstances of Naomi, God will bring the ultimate king. The grandson whom she said she would never have will be the grandfather of Israel's greatest king. And it will be from the line of David out of Bethlehem that another king would come. A king that would not only rule, but a king that would save. A king that would not only live, but a king that would die. A king that would not only die, but a king that will be raised. A king that would not only be a man, but the one who would die for our place because he is God-man. Out of Naomi's life, out of her family, would come Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. We have more reason than Naomi and Ruth to remember the Lord and to trust in his goodness. Why? Because you and I, friends, have experienced his goodness at the cross of Jesus. We look back at the cross and we say, God, while I was still a sinner, you sent your son to die for me, to save me, to redeem me, to show your love to me. I have more reason to trust you that if you could save me from my sin, you can take care of the details of my life. We have all the more reason to trust that he's good. We're about to come to communion. As we come to the table, we're inviting, God is inviting every one of us to put our trust in him to lay our burdens and our pain on him and to trust that he has a purpose. He has a plan. And his purposes are being worked out in your life today. Friends, if you want to remember the Lord, you can look straight at his son. If you want to find grounds to trust in God's goodness, you could look at the cross. If you want to commit your life to him, you can do it today. He's faithful. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean he's not working. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Just because you feel like he's silent doesn't mean that he's not moving stuff for you behind the scenes. He's good. He's gracious. He's kind. He's loving. And he calls us to trust him no matter what. You know, when we get to Ruth, as we continue this story, even though God isn't mentioned much, you're going to discover God is working constantly 
in the story. Chapter 2 is one of my favorite passages where we just see God just constantly just showing up, providing in ways that Naomi and Ruth never expected. And you'll see that. And you'll see that in your own life. You'll say, man, today I don't see him, but I can look back and see that God has a track record, that he's faithful and good. I love the song, Amazing Grace. I love that one line. It says, his grace has brought me safe this far. If it's brought me safe this far, the rest of the line says, his grace will lead me home. It will. If I look back and I can see God's goodness and faithfulness, I can look forward, regardless of what tomorrow looks like, and say, he'll still be faithful. Because the promise is he never changes. He's always the same. This morning as we come to the table, we're looking back and remembering his grace, his kindness, his mercy to us. So as you come to the table this morning, would you take a moment to reflect on your own heart, your own attitude, your own affections, your own desires? Where are you this morning? Are you trusting Jesus? Are you trusting in his goodness? Are you trusting in his kindness? Are you pushing into Jesus? Or are you pushing away from Jesus? Are you saying, God, I'm going to keep loving you, I'm going to keep serving you? Or are you pulling away when things get hard? Where are you? Would you take a moment to just reflect, meditate, spend some time with Jesus? When you're ready, would you come? Let's take communion together. Remember his faithfulness, his goodness, his kindness in our lives. Let's worship.